thanks, Damien, for that introduction. Basically, I'm not going to do an MVT summary of trials or anything like, like that. The purpose of my talk is basically to try and do what you guys would do as advisors, try and work out from the information you've got available what varieties might be worth looking at or considering for your growers to uh, adopt on your farm. So, what information is available? Okay, we've got obviously the MVT is number one, where we're going to get our information independently uh, reviewed and uh, interpreted. We've got now, with the privatisation of wheat breeding, a lot of wheat breeders out there doing extensive amount of work, a lot of resources going into breeding, and they've actually got all the breeding lines coming through, which we're probably going to see probably only 10% of them, I'm imagining, by the time they get to the MVT trials, of which then they go to the marketers, Sorry, I didn't have their logos and all that stuff, but marketers which then get it out to the grower groups, to the consultants, to the, to the farmers that way. But this role here has probably become very, very important alongside with a bit of self-promotion for a farming systems group, which basically means these guys are the ones that farmers are now looking forward to going to field days, interpreting results and telling them which variety they, they should adopt. And the farming systems groups are important because they're doing work that maybe the MVT protocol might not be able to address. Okay, so variety of specific management trials, those sort of things. I've got some questions over on, on this side that if you can text in, it's not really rapid, so if you can te text in, you know, what information or principal sources of information you use as advisors to determine your varieties that you consider. So is it the M MVT, is it on-farm trials, from the farming systems groups, breeders, others, any of those, if you can just sort of text which is the principal source of your information. So, you guys all have phones, companies, you should be able to quickly text, it won't be a cost really for you guys. So what are the risks? What are they? Um, we've got stubborn diseases, root diseases, foliar diseases, all those can play a part into what we choose in a variety. There's climate, so there's heat stress you've got to consider, frost, sprouting and drought tolerance. Uh, how it will fit into your, your quality, can you produce the quality required, say if you want a hard variety, APW, um, and those little other things like staining, test weight, protein, those little things all play a part into how a farmer's going to make profitability out of that. But what does it mean? Are we putting too much emphasis on it? And I think that confuses the whole way we interpret and decide on a variety. When you complicate things, by bringing all these other factors in, you can really cloud your judgement and lose your confidence. So what, we've got two responses. So that means 100% of people going through NVT. Oh, there's a couple of people looking at other sources. I imagine most of you guys will probably use a number of sources. Right? But the, uh, as I'd expect, the NVT is a principal source. So let's go to the NVT. You don't want to look at every single trial. You want to really look at the longer term performance. Now this is what I got for the, I picked the Wolpe up site. Long term performance, you can see, I'll just explain it without going through it. You've got the green, green bars, which is the predicted yields based on uh, meta-analysis and, and so many trials. And the red triangles are the number of trials or from that location that have made this data set. And you can see here that you've got, you know, uh, coral, You've got the likes of Axe, Yippee and a few other varieties that are up there to 25 years of trials on that site. And then you've got some of the newer varieties, uh, and I think Scout is uh, around that 20, 25 sort of mark, sorry, the number of trials of Wallpip is much higher for Yippee and stuff like that. But you know, you've got some of these newer varieties which are only going to be down here in this 10 to 15 year, years of trials. So how confident are these data, particularly when we've gone through 10 years of dry, below average rainfall? The other thing that surprises me a bit is that axe is quite high. Um, varieties such as uh, Yippee are, are middle range, but that's probably not too dissimilar. New varieties like Shield and stuff like that are down here. But that's the thing for me is that I'm, I'm pretty happy with that comparison, but you've, what does it mean? Does these error bars mean that this one here, Scout, is going to yield potentially the same as Frame? because that's the error in it. So as an advisor, does, does this really help you decide a variety for the Mallee farmers? If I go to Horsham, 
this for it? Yep. Same sort of thing. A lot of varieties down here. Anything weird with this one? Prize for anyone who gets something surprising for a higher rainfall area. What might be a variety that stands out there as probably not being that, or probably being a, a very good variety based on this data that you should probably adopt, that you're probably not going to. What's that? Russell? So why aren't people in the Wimmera growing axe? Some are, but it's the highest yielding variety. So there has to be a reason why people look at this, this um, data and don't believe it. And, and I'm not criticising MVT at all, I'm just trying to say that sometimes there's a strong influence of previous years in this long-term analysis. And that previous long-term analysis is that we've gone through a very strong dry period and that has influenced those shorter season varieties, such as Axe, in performing well. So what are some considerations you should be making when you're looking at this long-term performance data from the MVT? Is that trials earlier in 2012 may not have been sprayed for disease. Did disease impact any of those um, yield performances or predictions of those varieties? 2007, 2008 were very tough finishes for a lot of areas and those shorter season varieties featured very, very strongly. In fact, when you see something like 40 or 50% higher than site mean for those varieties, they're going to bring that average up of those varieties. Time of sowing within those years is also very important. Protocol, I think, for the M MVT is that they don't sow until after rain. There's enough seed bed and more moisture. A lot of those years, those trials have been sown in late May, June, and sometimes even July. So how are those longest main season varieties going to compete with those conditions? And more recent years, particularly in the Mallee, there has been removal of nitrogen from previous heavy crops that have not been replaced, and sometimes the yields or the proteins are lim nitrogen limited. And apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, but the uh, Mallee MVT trials are all around the 8 to 9% protein levels this year, which is far below the farmer um, averages probably of about 10 to 12. So what can a keen enthusiastic advisor do to compare varieties, create your own database and draw your own pretty graphs? So what I've done is I've just gone through the MVT trials and also BCG trials. I've pulled out four varieties that I really probably want to look at and I've just graphed them based on like an XY scatter. You can do it on, on your sheet. In fact, it's probably a good time if I can bring up that um, Excel database. Sorry. Uh, if you just scroll across to the uh, left. No, the other way, sorry. And go up, sorry. So what I've, what I've done here, you can sort of see I've got all the varieties listed there. Location, site mean, and I've sort of rounded off to a yield category percent site mean and percent yip yippee. So you can do this yourself quite easily on, on Excel. I imagine you guys are all, all know how to use Excel. The data's there, MVT website, you can pull it out and just plug it in. It's just time consuming. Okay, that's, that's fine, you can go back to the presentation. So I've done that for each, for each year and I've, I've pulled together this summary back to 2006. I've then graphed it like as it is. And you, I think, Colin, you, you showed me this, this sort of way of doing this analysis, and it's actually not a bad way to sort of look at it, taking out a lot of the error in a number of those, of those years. And this is then fitting a line of best fit. So you can see here, sorry for those colourblind people, but Mace is the top line there. Uh, Scout is the second one. Magenta, and then Axe. And as, as we expect, probably they cross over down here at about the half, half tonne mark and probably very little differences up to probably 1.5 tonne to the hectare mark. But as you get to the high yielding ends, we probably should be expe expecting, you know, Mace, Scout, Magenta, those varieties to really differentiate from Axe. And if you, and simply if you're a farmer or you're an advisor and your client's in this two and a half tonne to the hectare range, this could be a pretty good guide to give you an un understanding as to which variety might perform better in that environment. Any questions on that? Well, I'm still here. Okay. 
Okay, next one. The other thing you can do is look at the individual data points and a particular variety over, over those site means as a percent of the site mean. So not just looking at yield, which the last one was off, simple actual yield by site mean, we're just looking by a percent site, site mean now. So you can, as you can imagine, in a percent site mean, when you're getting those dry years, axe is sort of heading up. You're getting a really good benefit, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Yippee, pretty much plateauing, but that actually performing better than some other varieties in those dry years as well. Mace, we just haven't got enough data points. Magenta has been quite consistent, but it probably has a tendency to drop away. If you can see that, those trends, Scout is, is the interesting one, and limited data points down this end. In, in fact, th that point there is Marini this year, which I think was the lowest. There was a, I think the site mean was 0.5, so that, that was a pretty bad drought of site, so I'm probably not going to put too much emphasis on that one. But Scout is sort of performing really well in dry years. Coral was a bloody good variety. I haven't, I, I'm really saddened to see coral get out of the system, but coral has its problems with test weight and sprouting, but that was a consistent performer across most years with a really good disease profile. So that's another way you can do it. And this is just using that same simple database and it's allowing you to analyse it a little bit differently. Average it out. Pull all those things to the line of best fit. Now I'm not a big fan of doing it this way because if you do put a polynomial or something like that, what happens is it goes up and it looks ridiculous. So you kind of need to be very careful about, about using this line of best fit. But as a guide to put out to farmers, this is a pretty good situation where you can do, you know, here is Axe, you can see Axe is going very, very well as a percent of site mean uh, in those dry years and Scout is probably going very, very similar to that but then picking up over the top. Magenta is missing out on in those dry years because it really does struggle. So can anyone else tell me what's the problem with this graph as well? Which variety should I grow at the three tonne mark? Probably as a as a lower risk strategy, I probably should grow Axe. I'm, I'm only going to miss out probably five ten percent based on that, but I'm going to gain this in dry years. Are people going to do it? Do people believe it? Probably not. It's because we know that there's something with this data that is pushing it more favourable to Axe, and that is the time of sowing factor within this in this data set. And that principally, if you go back and look, what's driving those percentages up is 2007 2008. And they were years when it was a very tough finish. Um, sorry, I've been, it's been remiss of me to forget these questions on the side, but you know, what variety is most commonly growing in your area? If you want to text that, I can, we can talk about those things, but simply I'll continue going on with this. We can look at barley as well. Same sort of database, same MVT stuff. Gairdner, been the king probably for a fair while, but now we're starting to see a few new varieties come in real drop off in those dry years, um, but quite consistent from then on. High marsh, if you look at that, they're all of the same scale, up to 160. If you compared that with Gairdner, it would be well and truly above there. Um, high marsh is definitely something to, as a benchmark for us to compare to. You've got varieties like Scope that are consistent. Um, Commander is one like a Gairdner type, um, in terms of it needs to be sown early, particularly in those dry years. Oxford, uh, we have limited data down here, but it performs very, very well in a wet, wet year, which you would see in the last couple of years. Average that out too, this is what you get. Okay, and I'm, I guarantee if I asked you guys before this talk, draw me lines of best fit of where you think varieties are and how they would respond in different environments, you'd probably be able to all draw that. So considerations you guys should be <laughs> probably considering when going through this data is it's very seasonal dependent and it's probably gone in the days where we can compare longer term stuff without pulling together all the breeders uh, data, all the farming systems group data and the MVT data without raising a few of your eyebrows. Disease influence in the performance, very important, time of sowing features strongly but there are new projects now funded through GADC with the farming systems groups and other organisations that can help you better understand these uh, um, varieties. This is just a variety we had at Horsham, at BCG site. Uh, we do it in collaboration with Grant Holloway, who, who's in, in the room. Grant kindly does all the painful task of scoring varieties for disease, and we just have the fun job of harvesting the, the plots. As you can see, 
The grey bars are the ones that are disease free, so simply we just put the fungus oil on re regularly throughout at the year. We then have the white bars which are where we've allowed disease to continue and proliferate. So as you can imagine a susceptible variety is going to look orange and you're going to have another variety beside or down the line like coral which is going to be quite clean. And we're simply comparing what is the yield response. So for you as an advisor you might be in a paddock and a, a grower's there and he's saying oh look I've missed, I've missed spraying mace, it's gone orange, what should I do? Should I spray it? Should I not? This might give you an idea of what the yield loss is if they didn't spray it and where they're going to sit. Now, mace was the highest yielding variety at the site. Yielded uh, just under four, four tonnes. Unsprayed, it lost about 0.6 of a tonne to the hectare. But uh, unsprayed, it was probably still, my eyes might not be so great there, but it was still probably better than Yippie, Axe, Stock and Scout and that, that trial which is not really consistent with that other, other stuff we found but Gauntlet and spit, Spitfire. So at this particular site you know there was a yield loss from not spraying stripe rust and you can see that by the elevated uh, infection levels but you know that if the, all the M MVT trials were sprayed for mace, it would have, mace should have been a very good variety to grow or been, would have stood out quite well in those data sets. When we look at barley as well, 2011 was a very, very strong year for leaf rust. You may not have noticed it, it was very low in the canopy, particularly in higher yielding crops. And we did a trial at Rapanyup again with, with, with Grant and, and Mark McLean, and we did the same sort of thing, sprayed plots and left plots. Um, and you can see that when we got down to these susceptible varieties, the yield loss was quite substantial, in some cases more than a tonne to the hectare. So they, these were six to seven tonne crops and they're losing one tonne to the he hectare. If you were a farmer and you're losing 20% of the yield by, by not spraying your, your barley, how do, you th how do you think they're going to react to your advice? And was this reflected in the uh, trials we, we look at? Well yes it was, but it was done by different environments. So if I took the mean of the MVT trials in 2011 barley and just pulled them together based on their disease rating guide, you can see that in the Mallee there was a very slight, probably not a significant difference between a reduction in yield from, from leaf rust. Once we get into the higher rainfall areas, north, north central and Wimmera, there is a clear trend of those susceptible varieties being affected by leaf rust. Now, if I just grab this, this data as long term analysis like you guys would, without having seen those trials, or without having to seen the previous BCG trial, you guys would have to assume that, that those varieties, those several varieties in those years just perform poorly and that's going to impact how you interpret those longer term data. Thomas Owing, how, what does that mean? Okay, let's just say I sowed a trial last year at Sea Lake and I sowed it in late June, early July. Came up straight away, this, is, uh, this new high marsh replacement, Odger B 1101 Top the yields, but really high marsh scope skipper performed very, very well. If I sowed it a month earlier, well, 1101 comes down a little bit, but we've started to get a, a, different, a few other varieties performing quite well. If I sowed it a month earlier again, wow, Commander's done come up from, you know, probably the seventh variety down, it's come up sort of top the yields with Fathom and uh, Bullock scope skipper and high marsh. My point is, same soil type. Same rainfall, sowing times had a big impact on how a variety has been deemed as being, ha, has yielded basically. So these things are going to matter with the way you interpret the MVT trials. <coughs> so in summary, um, use several bits of information guys to make your decision on varieties. One thing I think you guys could do more of, and I don't know if you do do it, but I get excited sometimes when I, um, the last speaker earlier today said there's so much data on farm you can collect. Why can't you go to a farm and with the yield maps now, grab their, their yield data, ask for their sowing date, ask for what nu nutrition they planned. If you've got 20 clients and they've got 10 paddocks each, suddenly you've got a really good number of database where you can sort of compare what varieties they're growing, how, how they've yielded in that environment with that rain rainfall. You can start doing that, that stuff and help you understand 
you know, was there a management practice? Did some of these varieties perform well on fill peas compared to, say, growing on wheat stubble? You might be able to pick up those things and identify it. You don't have to have a trial to analyse how a variety performed on your, your area. Never choose a trial based on um, one year of data. I'm sure you're all very familiar with that, that now. And try and interpret, really, like, as a, as a person who's not a wheat breeder or anything like that, I don't necessarily know all the ins and outs of a variety and when it should perform and when it doesn't. That's Colin and Russell's job to do that. But try and look at the data and work out why it's not working or why that variety one year performed really well and this year it didn't. That's, that's the thing we've got to get through because then you'll realise what's driving those, those varieties perform well, whether it was a, a simple management practice such as time of sowing, whether it was a lack of nitrogen, or whether it was something like disease that came in and uh, stuffed up that performance. And the, this point here is probably the most important. Your, your grower, the end user, is the one that's going to decide whether he chucks or keeps the variety. And you might have a bloody good variety, like bull oak or scope for the Mallee, that gets chucked out because A, they can't deliver it, or B, it's got a bloody itch. So, and that doesn't come out in the M MVT trials either. <laughs> You can hear that when you talk to Russell or anyone who speaks, sits in a cab and those open trial plot headers, that those, those, those things are itchy. And encourage growers when they do adopt a variety to adopt it for maybe three or four years. Don't try it one year and do a paddock strip and then throw it out the next. There's got to be a good reason for them to adopt it and if they try it for five years they might find they like it. There's two ways of being, a variety being adopted and that is one's passive where they'll look at it for a number of years, small bit, and that's probably what happened with coral and they find two or three years, or one or two years where something like sprouting or test weight becomes a problem, it's gone. Then you find ways where something, a variety might just come in quickly because it's yielded very well in one year, it comes to a paddock situation, they'll throw it out the next year. So we really want to be pushing our growers now not to grow five to ten varieties on their farm because they're going to get confused. Try and get them to stick to one variety, pick one based on disease, resistance, and then how it's going to fit on their farm. And James Hunt's probably got a better um, topic to really talk about is winter wheats and how they might fit into to the farming system. But, um, that's probably all I've got to say here. Um, any questions that you guys might want to ask or uh, criticise me on? Well, just as a comment, as a, an evaluator of varieties down in the southern Victorian area, if you look at the late, or the, they're meant to be long season trials and they were sown in late May and so none of the varieties really got a chance to perform this year so you really do have to look at that sowing date very carefully. Yeah, And I'd, I'd really love if it is a sowing date, an emergence date as well. It's, and we've got to get to a stage where we've got to have photos and look at sites somehow because that site interpretation looking at it is very important. Cluster analysis, now I'm not, I haven't been exposed the other day was the first time I heard of it where they are actually clustering varieties and all those trials into say uh, a dry finish, wet, wet finish, you know, soft cool finish, those, those things and, and that would be useful as an advisor um, looking at stats being separated. I've probably done the old layman's term of going through physically and doing it myself which I wish I knew about this other analysis but it's actually enabled me to look at the trial data very carefully. Um, I think it should stay in there Anton, like if I'm reflecting over the past five years, acts it was a very dry, dry period, other than probably 2005, 2010 and 11. So, you know, I'm probably pretty happy to see that. It's a reflection of that year, but you've got to take that in consideration heading forward and on the farm profitability. And I think we've just got to acknowledge it. Simon, you've taken my question, really. I was going to actually make a comment about the cluster analysis stuff that the NVT is going to be doing. And I only looked at it yesterday myself, but I think it really does look quite exciting. And it takes a bit of getting your head around but it is just a fancy statistical way of looking at how trials over time have actually ranked varieties very similarly and it does have this ability to pull out things that have behaved the same and things that have behaved differently. And so you can clearly look at a data area, a data section in your area and pick those wetter finish years, the drier finish years, the bad stripe rust years. And, but you, the, the tricky bit is you actually need to know that information to actually pull out the differences as to why those trials are behaving differently. And they might be late sown years or late starts, for instance. But I think it does, that cluster analysis I think does 
show some real promise to you tease out the sort of stuff you've been talking about. Yeah. 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 Look, Phantom for me is it, it looks like a coral pla uh, placement. Um, one year data, like I've only had a look at it for one one year. Colin gave, gave me some soon. I looked at it on the farm and I also saw it in the trials. It looks very promising. Um, I think for me, heading back to the, the simple terms of trying to keep varieties narrowed down for growers, um, Scout being promoted to hard was a big, big step. And I think if it, if it was going to sit around that APW mark still and Phantom maintained that hard status, uh, then I probably would be inclined to go more towards that, provided Phantom yielded similar to Scout on a couple of years. Um, Wallop, same thing again, it came out la last year commercially, we got to look at it. Um, performed really, really well, but I think it's more a Wimmera sort of variety. Uh, certainly didn't go very well in the Mallee compared to, say, Korak, uh, some of those other varieties that we've seen. So um, for me, Scout, I've seen a number of years now, and it looks quite consistent as a high, high yielder, as well does Mace. So I'm pretty happy with those ones. I'm interested to look at Korak, Wallop, um, Phantom, uh, over a number of years now to see how they stack up. But I've really liked Fa Phantom as a uh, coral replacement, as a good disease one, and potentially as an earlier sowing. So I'm sure Colin would say that too. So Russell, you have a comment on Wallop? Um, on that, like, like there's, there's varieties like Shield as well, Dave, that are coming through. Uh, and I'm, we are getting a lot of varieties coming to market very quickly. And it's hard for us as advisors or, or people in trying to interpret that to work out, well, I know I want this grower to grow a new variety, keep them thinking, and they're always asking about these new varieties, but at the end of the day, it's how they manage the variety, not what variety they're growing. Uh, Simon, barley varieties going forward, we seem to have a lot of good old Gairdner around and Hindmarsh. There does seem to be a promising one coming along, I think it might be called Flinders, but uh, just wondered if you'd seen much of that as a, as a potential replacement for either one of those two varieties in the Wimmera Mallee? Yep. For one, every trial I've seen, MOT or BCGs where barley agronomies we've had a major focus on and we're managing, pushing barley varieties really to the limit of, of production as well as quality and high marsh, regardless of malt not being there, is the variety people should be growing simply because it yields so much higher than all those other varieties and the malt premium is not there. Um, of the new varieties, yes, you're right, there's a lot of Gairdner types coming through. Um, I really like Skipper as a, as a variety that's going to be potentially malt. Uh, it's seemingly yielding competitively with High Marsh, if there is a, a difference between those varieties. Um, there's also Fathom, which is a, a different feed barley. It's, it's, a, it's a bred from wild wild barley and uh, has some improved water use efficiencies and extract reduction and that yielded quite well in those trials. The other thing is that IGB 1101 is the high marsh replacement that if it gets malt that's the one that everyone should be thinking about. Um, I think gone are the days of us trying to get good quality Gairdner and farmers loving seeing that long head. Um, you know these small, these other new varieties are small compact heaps of grains in them and it's amazing how they yield. And I think profitability from a farmer's point of view, um, those varieties are the ones I'm looking at more so than a Gairdner type that uh, might yield less but give me better quality for the molsters. And the other thing you've got to think about is the malt varieties, where do you deliver it to? There's so much limitations on those things, like bull oak can't, can't be really delivered necessarily to a lot of places in the Mallee. And that was a big surprise for me because I always recommend it as a malt variety in the Mallee. And growers said, well, it's itchy, I can't deliver it anywhere. And there, you know, at the end of the day, they're the things that drive growers adopting varieties, not how they perform. So that's why I mean consider all those things in your overall decision making. So, But it might be a different case down your way, David, where there's more receivable sites available. Commander, Commander's done very well, well as well. It's remiss of me to forget that, but Commander's a very good performing variety. As long as you've got those other qualities you can ignore. Or sorry, that um, you don't have problems with cleaving or anything else. <laughs> 